Silence. All rise. This ceremony is to welcome Justice Sofronoff as President of the Court of Appeal. I'm afraid that the happy days when we could give a new judge some time to settle in before swearing him in are over. In order to get his honour onto the bench and hearing cases, hearing appeals as fast as possible, he was sworn in on Monday in a private ceremony attended by all the members of the court who could be present and uh, his wife, Ms Hock and his son, Sasha. So it's not strictly necessary that the commission appointing his honour be read, but I'll ask that it be done so that you can all hear it. Madam Registrar. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of Australia and to other realms and territories, Head of the Commonwealth. To our trusty and well-beloved Walter Sofronoff, Queen's Counsel, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws with Honours, Barrister. Greeting. Whereas His Excellency, the Governor in and over our State of Queensland in the Commonwealth of Australia, with the advice of the Executive Council of our said State, has seen fit to direct that you, Walter Sofronoff, being a barrister of the Supreme Court of our said State of at least five years standing and one of our counsel learned in the law, shall be appointed a judge of the said Supreme Court, a judge of appeal of the said court and president of the court of appeal. Now know you that we, reposing full trust and confidence in your loyalty, learning, integrity and ability, do hereby, in pursuance of the Constitution of Queensland 2001 and the Supreme Court of Queensland Act 1991, and in exercise of all powers and authorities enabling us in that behalf, appoint you, the said Walter Sofronoff, being a barrister of the said Supreme Court of such standing as aforesaid, to be a judge of the Supreme Court of our said state, a judge of appeal of the said court and president of the Court of Appeal, from and including the third day of April 2017, to have, hold, exercise and enjoy the said office due in good behaviour, together with all the rights, profits, powers, privileges and advantages thereunto belonging or appertaining. In testimony whereof we have caused the public seal of our said state to be hereunto affixed. Witness our trusty and well-beloved His Excellency the Honourable Paul de Jersey, Companion of the Order of Australia, Governor in and over the State of Queensland and its dependencies in the Commonwealth of Australia at Government House Brisbane, this 30th day of March in the year of our Lord, 2017, and in the 66th year of our reign, by command. Entered on record by me in the Register of Patents, number 50, page 106, this 30th day of March, AD 2017, Clerk of the Executive Council. The three regional judges, Justice McMeekin, Justice North and Justice Henry, join us by video link from their respective centres of Rockhampton, Townsville and Cairns. There are also links to, in place to Mackay and Southport. I note with pleasure among those physically present <coughs> to welcome Justice Sofranoff, the Honourable the Attorney General, Ms Darth, the Chief Judge and Judges of the District Court, Judges of the Federal Court, Family Court and Federal Circuit Court, the Acting Chief Magistrate and Magistrates, the President of the Land Court, members of the Industrial Court, Tribunal members and retired judges. Among the retired judges is a very important guest, retired President McMurdo. Shadow Attorney General Mr Ian Walker is unable to be present because of commitments in Townsville, but we have with us a former Attorney General and present Minister for Health, Mr Cameron Dick. At the bar table, we welcome and acknowledge Mr Dunning, the Solicitor General, 
Mr Hughes, President of the Bar Association, and Ms Smythe, President of the Law Society. And I welcome departmental representatives, members of community organisations, members of the academy, and members of the public who have joined us in the Banco Courts. As you can see, the court is filled to capacity and then some. And of course, we welcome very warmly Justice Sofronoff's family and friends, in particular, Ms. Hock and Sasha, and his honest sister-in-law, Mrs. Joy Sofronoff. Ms. Hock and Sasha, we look forward to your joining the court community. Ms. Hock, you've been known to most, if not all of us, for some time, but uh, meeting Sasha has been a new experience for me, at least, and it's a great pleasure. There are many apologies and expressions of regret from people unable to be present today. I'll mention only these. The Chief Justice and Justices Keane and Edelman of the High Court are sitting in Canberra and thus un unable to be present, while Justice Dowsett is overseas and very much regrets his inability to be here. President Sofrinoff, as Ms Smythe pointed out a couple of weeks ago at the valedictory for President McMurdo, you have big stilettos to fill. <laughs> it's a disturbing image, I know. <laughs> <laughs> President McMurdo guided the court with great distinction for almost 19 years, but there is uniform approval and enthusiasm for your appointment in and outside the court. You have not exactly hurried to judicial appointment, lingering at the bar for 40 years. It's nearly 30 years since you took silk, but you've performed a great deal of public service over your long career, occupying the position of Solicitor General between 2009 and 2014, conducting a commission of inquiry into the Grantham flooding in 2015, and a review of the parole system last year. And of course, you already have experience presiding in a court of appeal and not just an intermediate one. I refer, of course, to the Supercars National Court of Appeal. <laughs> I have read your reasons for decision in the matter of Triple Eight Race Engineering and Confederation of Australian Motorsport Limited. I'm not sure how you cite that. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honour, in a succinct decision, which augurs well for future judgments, dismissed an application to amend a notice of intention to appeal against a finding of careless driving in the 2016 super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. It involved a nice point of construction of the relevant rules. And may I say, you did not let any of your natural disapproval of people who drive fast cars fecklessly <laughs> seep into your decision in any way. More seriously, your appointment as President of the Court of Appeal is a very important one for the judiciary, the legal profession and for the public of Queensland. Very few Queensland litigants obtain special leave to appeal to the High Court. There were only seven last year, for example. So the Court of Appeal is really the final destination for almost all of the appeals brought from the District and Supreme Courts. You are only the third President of the Court of Appeal in its 25-year history, and you're fortunate enough to follow a leader in President McMurdo who set the Court on a steady and effective path. Your long legal career has fitted you superbly for this position. You have been one of those rare all-rounders in the profession who can turn your hand to anything including, importantly for this role, criminal work at trial level and appellate level and perform it at a rare level of excellence. There will also be the demands of increasing workloads and the need both to develop new procedures and to identify and introduce any technology which might help in dealing with those demands. I'm sure that given your intellectual curiosity and adventurous spirit, you will meet those organisational challenges with zest. On behalf of all the judges, I congratulate Justice Sofrinoff on, as he's on his appointment as President of the Court of Appeal, and I welcome him to the Court. Thank you, Chief Justice. Ms Darth. May it please the Court, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we hold 
um, this event this morning and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, can I acknowledge the Honourable Catherine Holmes, Chief Justice and Justices of the Supreme Court, the Honourable Kerry O'Brien, Chief Judge and Judges of the District Court, Acting Chief Magistrate, Members of the Magistracy, Judges of the Federal, Family and Land Courts, Members of Tribunals, the Honourable Cameron Dick, Minister for Health and Ambulance Services, Peter Dunning, QC Solicitor General, Mr Christopher Hughes, QC President of the Bar Association of Queensland, Ms Christine Smythe, President of Queensland Law Society, uh, a special mention, of course, to former President the Honourable Justice Margaret McMurdo, distinguished guests, friends and family. We are all here today to welcome the Honourable Justice Walter Sofnoff, QC, as President of the Court of Appeal and as a Justice of the Supreme Court. Your Honour, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this position. Your Honour is just the third person appointed to lead this Court of Appeal, which celebrated its 25th anniversary in this courtroom just a few weeks ago. Your Honour inherits a significant legacy of distinguished judicial administration and innovation. Under former presidents Tony Fitzgerald QC and Margaret McMurdo, the Queensland Court of Appeal has been blessed with outstanding leadership. The court's reputation and standing has continued to grow, as has its contribution to the administration of justice <coughs> in our state. Your Honour is eminently qualified to hold this position, to assume the mantle and navigate the court through the challenges and opportunities that will come ahead. Your Honour is one of the most respected legal practitioners in Queensland a brilliant legal mind and a person of an exceptional character and integrity. Your Honour has a deserved reputation for promoting the independence of the judiciary and the role of the courts as a cornerstone of our system of democracy. Your Honour has been well known for almost 40 years as one of Australia's leading barristers. You were first called to the bar in 1977 and took silk in 1988. <coughs> Justice Sofnoff will bring to the bench more than his legal skills and training. You will bring the diversity of interests that have made you an interesting member of chambers in the past. I'm not sure if you'll find a skateboarding colleague in the Court of Appeal, but there are many, or there may be some, open to learning some new skills. While Your Honour may have appeared for the State of Queensland on numerous occasions in the High Court, you also appeared in the High Court for the WIC peoples against the State of Queensland. Many would have seen the photos of that appearance, with half of the country's silks seemingly lined up at the opposite end of the bar table. In true fashion, you relied on the weight of your argument, undaunted by the weight of the opposition, and thereby contributed to yet another lengthy constitutional law case for all Australian law students to read, or at least of which to read the headnote. <laughs> the invaluable qualities which Your Honour will bring to the bench are the qualities which made you such an outstanding advocate, an unerring ability to take what may be volumes of material in any case and to identify the maybe two significant points on which that case will turn. You have the capacity to analyse what can be complex issues and distill them into easily digested legal arguments. These skills will be self-evident to all who appear before Your Honour. Your Honour served the people of Queensland with dedication and distinction as Queensland Solicitor General from 2005 to 2014. The Solicitor General is the second law officer of the state, and to your role, Solicitor General, Your Honour brought brilliant legal acumen, a temper temperament, seemingly tirelessly energy, and unfaltering integrity. Integrity is the defining word that is the hallmark of Justice Sofronoff's tenure as Solicitor General. And yet, for all of this, it is Your Honour's compassion and your humility that the people of Grantham will remember for your conduct of the Grantham Floods Commission of Inquiry. It was an exercise in the fact that people are less concerned about the results of an inquiry than in knowing the process was fair and they were treated respectfully. Everyone involved in that inquiry felt each of those things, and that is a great credit to Your Honour. Most recently, Your Honour's contribution to improving public administration, including leading the most comprehensive review of Queensland's parole system in decades. Your Honour has a long history of service to the courts and the legal profession. Your Honour was a member of the Committee of the Bar Association of Queensland from 1980 to 1982, Vice President of the Bar Association of Queensland from 1992 to 94, President of the Bar Association of Queensland from 1994 to 96. Member of the Incorporated Council of Law Reporting 1999 to 2004, 
President of the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Tribunal from 2001 to 2005, and is a Fellow of the Institute of Arbitrators and Mediators Australia. Your Honour has also worked to mentor to subsequent generations of legal professionals and students of law. Your Honour is a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, a lecturer at the Bar Practice Course, a lecturer at the Queensland Law Society Continuing Legal Education Program, and at the Bar Association of Queensland Advanced Legal Education Program, and a member of the University of Queensland Law School Advisory Board. Your Honour was also a member of the Royal Australian Navy Reserve from 2003 to, through to 2014, an adjunct professor of law at the University of Queensland 1999, a regular contributor to legal symposiums, conferences and seminars, and a qualified mediator. Your Honour's workload may explain the report in the Courier Mail last week that when packing up your chambers in Brisbane, as well as a piano and a very impressive rack of guitars, there was also a collection of Superman statues. Your Honour's ability to find time for these pursuits amid your prestigious workload is legendary. Your professional renown rests upon your reputations, dazzling advocacy, consummate strategy and the exacting substance of Your Honour's exacting legal arguments. Your Honour's standing in the legal and broader community is impressive. Your character, personal and professional integrity and commitment to justice will aid you in leading this court into the future. Queensland can only be regarded as a fortunate state to enjoy the calibre of talent that abounds in our justice and legal sector, as seen in the outstanding generation of emerging jurors. I have every confidence that Your Honour will provide a distinguished service to the people of Queensland and the interests of justice. I thank you for dedicating your extensive intellect and experience to leading our appeal <coughs> jurisdiction. All of us looking forward to this next fascinating chapter Your Honour will bring to the already impressive history of Queensland's Court of Appeal. May I please the court. Mr Dunning. May I please Mr Hughes. May it please the court, Chief Justice, Justices of the Supreme Court, Justices and members of the District Court, the Magistrates Court, the Land Court, the Industrial Court and the Tribunals of the State of Queensland. Justices of the Federal Courts and Tribunals, including the Federal Magistrates Court, the Family Court and the Federal Court, retired judicial officers, Madam Attorney, distinguished guests, fellow practitioners from both branches of the profession, ladies and gentlemen. Justice Sofronoff, it gives me enormous pleasure on behalf of the Barristers of Queensland to congratulate you on your appointment as the third president in the 25-year history of the Court of Appeal in this state. It would be less of frank than me if I did not say that there are a number of people in this room who are bitterly, bitterly disappointed that it was you who was appointed to this role. I speak, of course, of the numerous junior barristers who are looking forward to being led by you over the next few months, particularly in the Court of Appeal, and more importantly, in the applications for special leave in the High Court, which, as the Chief Justice has reminded us, takes a very special skill. Your absence from these matters is a source of great lament for many of my members. As every barrister in Queensland knows, Justice Sofronoff, you come to this role with a fine intellect, an excellent knowledge of the law, a gift with the English language, and a wealth of experience in the appellate courts, particularly the High Court of Australia and this court, the Court of Appeal in Queensland, over which you now preside. Your Honour enjoys, as I wrote to you recently, not merely the respect of your former colleagues at the Queensland Bar, but enormous respect from many interstate counsel and even judges. Your experience and your capacity in appellate work equip you most ably to carry out your work in this court. I must confess to being one of many at the Bar who was just a little surprised that you accepted the appointment. You seemed, as the Chief Justice has said, so comfortable at the bar for so long. But surprise is an ephemeral and a wasted emotion. What is more important is that your former colleagues at the bar are more than a little pleased that you have taken up this role. The attorney is to be commended for having both offered you the appointment and for, no doubt, insisting that you take it. A recent article in a local newspaper, which I would not normally refer to, but I've been emboldened by the reference by the attorney herself, 
suggested quite remarkably that because you were not a sitting judge at the time of your appointment, you might be seen as an outsider. Nothing could be further from the truth. The authors of that article ignore that for a long time there's been a school of thought that the role of chief justices, chief judges or presidents of courts can and often should, where there is appropriate merit, be appointed from the bar. While this view and this practice have fallen somewhat into duesitude, there is no doubt that your appointment involves entirely appropriate merit. Notwithstanding your honours protestations of Russian nobility, over more recent years, it's clear that you were raised as a Queensland boy. You were educated at Churchy and the University of Queensland, and former members of those establishments are justifiably proud of your elevation today. At the university, as we've heard, your honour graduated in arts and law with honours. Of your honours, many public services and roles of which the attorney has spoken, the Bar Association of Queensland is particularly mindful of the service you've given in two positions. First and foremost, you were, as we've heard from the attorney, Solicitor General for the state for almost a decade, following the time in that office of your friend Justice Keane, now of the High Court. Second, you served not only as a member of the Committee of the Association of Queensland, a Bar Association of Queensland, but also its Vice President and its President from 1994 to 1996. My association remains grateful not only for the work you did in those years, but also for your ongoing contribution to the activities of the association, including its program of continuing practice development. Your Honour has, with great courage, spoken out on occasions about matters in respect of which you have harboured strong views. Obviously, in any given situation, not all of the diverse range of members of an association like the Bar Association will have agreed wholeheartedly with everything that you've said. But all of us applaud, first, the role that you've been prepared to play in public affairs in this state. Second, your preparedness to bring your intellect to bear in such affairs. And third, your preparedness to speak out when you felt it appropriate. You have now assumed an important role involving not just dispensing justice according to law in this very important appellate court, but also ensuring, as your immediate predecessor has done so well for nearly two decades, that the conduct of proceedings in the appeal court involves a civilised exchange between the bench and the bar. This process, as I've often said, and many of my members agree, is important in ensuring that all parties and all arguments are given a proper hearing and that justice is both done and seen to be done. I'm confident that not one of my members doubts your honour's capacity to achieve these important goals for the betterment of this state. Your Honour, your friends at the bar trust that you will still have some time for your remarkable range of recreational activities, which go from flying and skydiving through trap shooting and snow skiing to scuba diving, and of course there's your interest in both motorcycles and exotic motor vehicles and even motorised scooters. Now, of course, your Honour needs to learn a new skill, and that is to wear very high-heeled shoes. <laughs> Should your honour come to a mishap, we all know that it won't be the first time you've fallen from a great height. <laughs> the barristers of Queensland wish you well as you adopt the more sombre role as the President of the Court of Appeal. We look forward to the further contribution to the history and the law of this state that your honour will no doubt make in your new role. Once again, your honour, I congratulate you on behalf of the barristers of Queensland. May it please the Court. It's mine. May it please the court, I am honoured to be here today on behalf of the Solicitors of Queensland to welcome Your Honour to your new role as President of the Court of Appeal. I add my voice to the chorus of welcome today, which I can assure you is heartfelt throughout the profession in Queensland. Your Honour takes the leadership of our state's highest court at a time when the rule of law is being challenged from political and media pundits alike, and when rational assessment is being replaced by shrill populism in our public debate, 
It is not a time for the faint-hearted. As the saying goes, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And the Queensland legal system is fortunate to have in your honours appointment one who is no stranger to standing up for the rule of law and staring down critics in both the media and parliament. That unwavering commitment to justice and the doing of it has characterised your honours legal career and has much to do with the regard in which your honour is held and the resounding approbation your honours appointment has brought forth in the state's legal ranks. Your honour is, of course, highly regarded for your skill as an advocate, and even more so because you have remained a genuine all-rounder, in that your practice has never been limited to one area of law, having excelled in a broad range of jurisdictions. You have been prepared to appear in all courts, from the Magistrates' Court to the High Court of Australia. That experience will no doubt assist your honour in understanding the plight of litigants and their representatives when they appear before you. And that understanding will increase their confidence in your decisions, an essential element of our system. Your Honour can also put the lie to the oft-stated opinion that the judiciary is out of touch. As we've heard so much today, you have passions such as collecting guitars and motorcycle riding, which are myriad across all echelons of society. Your Honour is, of course, well known to the public for the sight of your Ferrari whizzing down the freeway. I'm told it's because being a Ferrari, your honour is usually in a passenger seat of a tow truck carrying the car, but it still looks good. <laughs> I'm also told that Ferraris are made to look like they're moving quickly, even when they are standing still, because they usually are. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the ob observation of the envious. Your honour's love of cars started early, in your churchy years, when I'm told that the possession of an international driver's licence allowed you to use motorised transport at a time when your peers were limited to their trusty Melbourne stars. You have also happily turned your skills to many and varied pastimes, representing the Bar Association on the soccer field, directing a production of Macbeth and indulging in a passion, passion, passion for vintage aircraft flying. That you managed to walk away from all three activities is a worthy achievement. <laughs> We've also heard today that Your Honour has had the honour of being the Vice President and President of the Bar Associations, Association, which brings their own challenges, and they are ones to which I can relate. A cynic might suggest that these experiences were somewhat of an inspiration when you were directing Macbeth, but I would, of course, be not so bold to mention that. <laughs> In truth, that you took the extra pressure of leading the Bar despite a busy practice is indicative of someone eager to give back to the profession an excellent quality for the leader of our highest court, and I expect your experiences in that role will serve you well in this one. Your celebrated and principled tenure as Solicitor General also displayed the admirable commitment to the ethical and professional tenets that will be essential in maintaining stellar standards set by your predecessor. And of course, speaking of your predecessor, it has been noted today that I did mention Justice McMurdo's valedictory that she left some pretty big shoes to fill and that they were, in fact, stilettos. I can only say that should Your Honour experience some difficulty walking in them, I can give you some assistance in that regard. In closing, I wish Your Honour well in your new role and assure you that you have the support of the Solicitors of Queensland. We look forward to a long and successful stewardship of the court under your guidance. May it please the court. <coughs> Thank you, Ms May. Justice Sofinov. Chief Justice. Colleagues from all courts and friends, thank you for taking the trouble to be here with me today to celebrate uh, my appointment. Attorney General, thank you for your uh, generous words today, your two generous words. I'm deeply moved by the confidence that the government has shown in me, and not just because of the high office to which I have been appointed, but particularly because of the stature of my predecessor, Margaret McMurdo, uh, to me, it is a matchless honour to be selected to follow her. Mr Hughes, I thank you for your kind remarks. I have loved being a barrister. I have always regarded the Bar Association as an institution that, despite its small size, is an important component in our social system. This has been because, over the decades, its leaders have forged a justified reputation for candid and objective advice to whoever needs it. I have every confidence that the judiciary can rely upon the Bar Association as much in the future as it, has, as it has been able to do so in the past. 
Ms. Smythe, thank you very much for your words today. I was very, very inexperienced uh, when I became a barrister. Um, that's overstating it. I, w I had no experience when I became a barrister. And in fact, to be candid, I was wet behind the ears. It was solicitors, your members, who over many years, beginning then in 1978, who taught me much, uh, in, in, beat it into me, really, and particularly they have taught me by their example that clients matter much more than the intellectual problem that the case presents, which is something that uh, barristers are uh, more likely to be drawn to. I'm so grateful to my colleagues at Bracton Chambers, who for almost 30 years tolerated my high needs for maintenance and my low dress standards. <laughs> they informed me, they educated me, and they inspired me. I'm grateful, too, to my recent chambermates at Murray Gleeson Chambers. You have been great company. You are real barristers, and you have given me alternately uh, grey hairs, and you have kept me young. I could not have wished for better people to spend what turned out to be the last years uh, of my career at the bar. In particular, I'm grateful and thankful for my friendship with Peter Davis, a remarkable man and a remarkable barrister, a gifted intellect, and a man who has been my intimate ally and my comrade who has supported me and backed me in the blackest of times. Delma, you are my personal assistant and accomplice. Thank you for the years at Bracton and at Murray Gleeson, and thank you for being willing to come with me to the court. I think that willingness of yours was the tipping point for me. My friend Richard Chesterman once said that the bench was like heaven. You tend to say, yes, please, Lord, but not yet. I've been saying not yet in my mind for too long, and I have to report to you that the bench is indeed heavenly. And while not a des destination to which you should rush, it's also not a destination like me to avoid for too long. I cannot adequately describe to you the warmth of the welcome given to me by my colleagues on the Supreme Court and by the staff here. It has overwhelmed me. Margaret McMurdo, I am now at last becoming dimly aware of just what you have achieved in this office. Because you never called attention to yourself or to the great work you have done out of the public eye, I had not fully appreciated the depth and the scope of your endeavors for the people of Queensland. And I promise to you that I'll devote myself to the utmost of my ability to protect and to develop what you have established. Somebody, it may have been Justice Philip McMurdo, said that now another president has been appointed who has Russian connections. That is true. It also, it also happens to be relevant to some points that I wish to make, two points. And for that reason, I want to say something about my family history, a subject about which I generally don't like to speak. My father was born in 1910 in Siberia, in a village near Lake Baikal, near the Russian-Mongolian border. His family was Cossack. The Cossacks were a socialist state in Russian civil society, an independent people who, in time of war, elected their own leader, and in time of peace had no need for a leader. Only by arrangement could they be persuaded to serve the central Moscow authority. They could not be cowed. By 1930, the Bolsheviks had won the civil war and the process of collectivization of agriculture had begun and it reached the village in which my father's family lived. The process of the physical destruction of the Cossacks as independent people also began. My father, aged 20, left his home, left Russia on horseback with a group of his friends riding into Mongolia. He would never return. He would never see his family again. His only skill and experience was with horses and trading them. I guess he was a used horse trade. Uh, uh, used horse dealer, um, brought him in the mid-30s, 1930s, to Shanghai in China, where he met the woman that he married, my mother. Her family, too, were refugees. They had fled from Harbin in Manchuria that had been occupied by the Japanese. 
My brother was born in Shanghai just before the Sino-Japanese War started, and Shanghai was occupied by the Japanese army. And then came World War II. The end of the war brought revolution again, and my father and mother and my brother fled revolution again as refugees. The Philippines, then a very poor country with great generosity, accepted uh, over 6,000 Russian anti-communist refugees and housed them in a camp on the island of Tubabao until a permanent refuge could be found for them. My father, my mother, and my brother were among these and lived on Tubabao in a tent city for a long time. Australia accepted them, and they came here as refugees. We would now call them, I suppose, asylum seekers. My father got work as a laborer, and my sister and I were born here. By strange coincidence, Justice Keene's father-in-law, Dr. Shelley Keene's father, was the solicitor who handled the conveyance when my, fa my, when my father finally paid a deposit for a house in the early 1950s. By an even weirder coincidence, my mother got a job, in her opinion, the best job she ever had, at a rubber boot factory in a brick building that then stood on the corner of North Quay and Turbot Street. That building was later bought by Brisbane's barristers and became the Inns of Court. The brick building was demolished and the present Inns of Court stands on that site. My father found work in Hong Kong in 1955 and the family moved there. We spoke Russian at home. It was my first language. I spoke Cantonese as my second language, the language of the playground and of the streets in which I played with my friends. My sister and I only began to learn to speak English when we went to school. She with an English accent and me with an American accent. Our different groups of friends uh, gave us their accents. But Russian and Cantonese was what we spoke otherwise, uh, often at the same time, in the same sentence, indiscriminately. In 1966, I was transported to Australia. I lived with my brother Alex and Joy, his wife, who's here today. My brother has died, and I never express my thanks to him for taking me in. But I can now thank you, Joy, as a just-married mother of two children under five, the last thing you needed was a pimply 13-year-old in your household, and I'm grateful and have been for many years conscious of your generosity of spirit in taking me in and putting up with me. I want to make two points out of this tale. My, fa my father and my mother knew and understood that there was something that they would gain for themselves, for their son, my brother, by coming here. My father used to refer to this by using, using the Russian word for order. He would say that there is order here. He had experienced order under tyranny, the kind you achieve by obedience, but what he wanted as a refugee and what he found here was order of a different kind. Of course, by order, he really meant the rule of law. I believe that freedom is the product of civilization, not an inherent attribute of, nations, of nature. A civilized society, I think, will evolve not by people deciding to obey laws or by being made to obey laws, but by a spontaneous willingness on the part of a group of people to conform to the same standards of conduct. Such a group, such a society will, in my view, over the course of time, also determine that there are some things that nobody has the power to do. From this, it would follow that minorities will regard it as right and just to submit to laws conceived and made by the majority, because the majority is prepared to submit itself to those same laws. It's not a trivial historical fact that prior to the departure of Governor Philip from England, that by an imperial act, the Crown was authorized to establish a court of criminal jurisdiction and a court of civil jurisdiction for the colony of New South Wales, which was then seen as nothing more than a prison. Pursuant to that imperial act by letters patent, the Crown established a court of criminal jurisdiction and a court of civil jurisdiction for New South Wales. 
Governor Philip arrived here in January 1788. In July 1788, the first writ was issued out of the Court of Civil Jurisdiction in New South Wales at the suit of Henry and Susanna Cable, which is a nice coincidence. Two convicts who sued the captain of the ship which had transported them, but who had failed to deliver their baggage. The court gave judgment for the plaintiffs. From the first days of settlement, therefore, judicial power was exercised by a judicial authority and nobody else, and was open to all. In due course, habituated patterns of rational lawmaking, followed by lawful, by, by voluntary, sometimes even cheerful obedience to laws that apply to everyone, and that are applied and enforced impartially, will result in the evolution of legal institutions of an enduring kind, a legislature, courts, an executive, comprised of people acting instinctively in accordance with the rule of law. It's an unshakable willingness on the part of all of us to conform to these fundamentals. It is our inner convictions that cannot be shaken which has resulted in Australia's stable constitutional democracy. In my view, everything else is just ink on paper. This is what my father understood, I think. This is what many refugees who continue to strive to come here also understand. And that's what I understand. It is our conviction, I think, I think we believe in rules that are rational and noble, in rules that apply to everyone equally. In short, we believe in fair play. And we believe in repelling any kind of corruption or distortion of our institutions that would pervert the conduct of the people who constitute those institutions. I think that we take a lot of these things for granted. And I think that when people take these things for granted and are right for doing so at the particular time, it's proof that these institutions are functioning properly. It's proof of their enduring strength. I'm grateful that we can take them for granted. We in this country are so deeply committed to these beliefs that any tampering with the integrity of the foundations of our civil system by anyone in any way draws immediate outrage from within the institutions and from the people themselves. The bar is one of these institutions. It's built on a foundation of duty to the court, duty to the client, and of sedulous honesty. I love the bar very much. I was a callow and naive law student, unlike those I meet today. And I began to read the memoirs and biographies of the great English barristers, men like Thomas Erskine and Patrick Hastings and Marshall Hall and F.E. Smith, those books related and expounded their conduct in court and out of it. They were courageous advocates. They propounded, they asserted, and they advocated the just application of law not only against the state or against rich opponents, but if need be, against the tendency of the very judge hearing the case if necessary. They were idealistic things that I read as a naive law student and I believed in them all. After almost 40 years of practice, 10 as a junior and almost 30 as a silk, I found that these things were all true. The second point I wish to draw from this history of mine is a small one, but because this point recurs continually, it's an important point and it is this. Some people think that lawyers and particularly leading lawyers and judges, are drawn from some Australian aristocracy or elite stratum, and that, as a consequence, we are out of touch. If that were true, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Finally, I want to thank my wife, Margaret, and my son, Sasha. It's difficult to express what I feel, Margaret. You've sustained me through very difficult times, and you've heartened me consoled me and loved me. Sasha, keep doing whatever it is that you are doing. You make me happy. Thank you. Um, you are all very welcome to join us for morning tea in the precincts of the court after the ceremony is adjourned. Adjourn the court. All right. Court is adjourned.